Since the 1970s and 80s, research studies in a variety of disciplines have documented the more macro-level, institutional and politically contingent aspects of Muslim life in Britain. However, much less attention has been focused on the daily lives, the motivation and the voices of the individuals themselves who make up Muslim society. I'm sure you'd agree with me that this selective focus leaves us with only a partial and reductionist picture of Muslim life. It may be suggested, and I quote from Bektovich, that focusing only on the visual and the ritual narrows down Islamic identity considerably. And this demands that building a multicultural and global society requires we initiate deeper and more many meaningful conversations between cultures. And this is something I'm glad to hear that every single speaker we've had today has, has undermined. Even less has been studied with regards to Muslim women in secular Western society specifically, other than the more visible and sensational aspects of their lives, such as the hijab, problems of FGM, and forced marriage. Both academic but more so popular media coverage highlight these women as passive victims of a patriarchal social system inherent to their faith and culture, needing the emancipation that only a Western liberal system can provide. And while we cannot deny that such coverage is necessary in highlighting oppressive practices, we need to move on from this reactionary approach to Muslim issues raised in politics and the press towards more dialogic approaches. Indeed, only recently has research turned away from the narrow veil and victimhood approach that we've heard so much about today to Muslim women to examine more nuanced areas of work, such as youth work, involvement in labor markets, and civil society. In all of this, however, one cannot help but ask, where are the Muslim women's own concerns voiced on their own terms? It is the contention of my paper that, with increasing numbers of Western Muslims themselves entering academia and popular discourses, we are now in a position to shift this narrative in ways that do justice to those it purports to represent, and welcome them to, in fact, join the dialogue. In my capacity as an active participant and a researcher of the British Muslim community, I'd like to bring the concerns of Muslim women to the debate. Does the ubiquitous force on veil and victimhood actually reflect issues of rising concern for them? My study can be situated within the rising body of research that is beginning to document the lives of ordinary yet engaged British Muslim women, women at grassroots level who are giving back to the communities in which they live and work. I avoid Muslim women with very high public profiles, those that have already received a lot of coverage, in favor of the unheard majority of socially active women whose work sustains Muslim communities across Britain. I examine their contributions, their motivation, and look at the work of these activists in and around London. I also do fully recognize that my respondents may not be the average Muslim women in this country, and that many of them today still suffer from unfair and oppressive structures of not just family, but also state. However, I would humbly suggest that the value of listening to strong, proactive, and contributing Muslim women, such as my respondents are, lies in the potential they offer as a way forward for minority women across Britain. On a daily basis, these women are disrupting popular notions of what it means to be a British Muslim and breaking down stereotypes. Today, I'd like to share some of my preliminary findings with you. Amongst other themes, the women in my sample spoke about motivation and empowerment, their experiences as British women living in a secular society, and their vision for the future of British Muslims. So far, what have I found? I find my respondents to be strong, resourceful women who have been shaped by past experiences, sometimes highly traumatic ones. However, they've come through these experiences not as victims, not blaming external peoples or factors for their situations, but instead have been empowered by them and they take responsibility for moving forward. So, and I use my data extensively so that I'm speaking not in my voice, but in theirs. Isra, and I use pseudonyms throughout, 
Isra has come through years of living through an abusive marriage, raising three children on her own, and a painful divorce. However, she does not blame her ex-husband, Muslim social norms, conservative practices, and she does not consider herself a victim. Instead, she uses her experiences of mental trauma to inform her training as a mental health practitioner. And, in her own words, she told me that her experiences made her strong and made her humble. Another young single woman I had the privilege of interviewing, active in youth work, actually stressed the need for the Muslim community to take responsibility for the situations in which they find themselves. Sarah, speaking of recurring negative images that we're all very familiar with in the media, says, there should be a positive presence, of Muslims in the media that is, and there is a small presence. We need to take responsibility for increasing that presence. I also find overwhelmingly that faith is central to how these women define themselves and central to their motivation to contribute to British society and give back to others. And I quote again, Shabnam, a young IT consultant, a mother of five, and a community activist in her spare time, yes, she does have some spare time, told me, and I quote, my faith is very important. It is how you behave, your character. If you are religious and it doesn't infiltrate your actions, there's something wrong. So when I see glitches in my character, I see that primarily as an impact of my lack of faith. When do you see those caricatures in the daily press, on the news? Very rarely, unfortunately. Similarly, Mariam, a young London lawyer that I spoke to, she gives her time to community cohesion projects, and she told me, I quote, My faith is part of who I am. It gives me perspective in life and helps me stay calm in stressful phases of life. For me, faith is a very peaceful, calming, beautiful thing, and it makes me sad that it is so often misrepresented by others. Moving on. We explored what life was like for them in today's liberal secular Britain. And I quote again, Mariam told me, my being a Muslim has not changed things in any way. People are welcoming, and I'm trying to raise awareness simply as a member of society. Similarly, Sara told me, comparing how she feels as a Muslim in this country to when she visited a well-known pancake restaurant in Texas. No offense to Peter, I grew up in the States as well, but we can relate to this, some of us. Sarah said, I think we are really, really, really lucky here. I remember I walked into an IHOP restaurant in Texas. I never felt so uncomfortable in my life. Here in England, you do see a lot of hijabis out to dinners and lunches with loads of colleagues. I thought, I am very lucky to be in England. Having said that, while their experience of British society and real people generally is quite positive, my respondents felt that the media deserves special mention. Negative and unrepresentative images of these women have had a serious detrimental impact on them, and this can sometimes manifest in mental health issues for the women that I spoke to. And this is why I quote quite extensively here to show the really raw anger that these women spoke with. I was told, no, they are not represented. They are represented badly. I watched an episode of EastEnders the other day. They had a Muslim person in hijab. I think she was pregnant. The Muslim family is always in the pub. It's ridiculous what they've tried to portray. The only positive things are the Bake Off and the H&M model. When she was on the show, referring to Nani Hussain of Bake Off fame, whom we all love, don't we, Rabia? When she was on the show, it's like we were on the show. It showed Muslim women as just normal people. You can read the rest of the quote up there, but what really struck me is this woman had to come out and say, hey, I'm just normal. And how many other minorities and indeed people from the majority come out and state the fact that they're just normal people? In terms of my findings so far, another striking theme is the desire of these women to reach out and communicate with people in wider society, beyond their own neighborhoods and their own faith and cultural communities. In fact, they see it as a necessity in their vision for the future of a multicultural and multi-faith Britain. And those of you that were here this morning 
Karen Armstrong as well underlined the necessity of doing this today. So, I have another quote up here. I was told it's like living in a bubble. I don't know if you're familiar with Luton, Peter. Luton is like that, I was told. It's like living in a bubble. You could turn up there in a hundred years' time and they'd still be doing the same thing. No offence to Lutonians. And they don't mix with other white people. It's not a good way to be brought up. Unfortunately, most of my friends are still Muslim, and I don't like that. I would prefer to say that all my friends are mixed. I wish it was like that for me, and I hope that it will be like that for my children. Similarly, I was also told they, as in Muslims, need to respect and talk to non-Muslims because they need to recognize that it's a shared space. Moving on, however, when I spoke about their vision for the future, they were not as upbeat and positive. I quote, I see it as quite bleak, to be honest. I try not to look too much at social media. The negativity is quite awful. Our kids will have to witness a lot of the fallout from what's going to come. I hope they grow up to be well-rounded individuals, integrate well into society, and are not scared not self-conscious of their hijab, their religion, and can practice freely but still integrate. To sum up their views, the small but growing number of publicly active and indeed integrated and articulated British Muslim women speak of a positive and largely accommodating experience in public and in the workplace. They feel respected and generally welcome. Yet, this all changes when they encounter on a daily basis the media generated veil and victimhood image created about them, but not by them, neither for them. We all know that this also generates Islamophobic attacks and vilification by complete strangers. <coughs> Their vision for the future of Muslims in Britain is to be able to practice freely, but still integrate. At this point, I'd like to come back to the pervasive focus we see everywhere on women's dress and victimhood. It was mentioned this morning as well. And to contextualize it more broadly within the concerns of the women that I speak to and the wider academic field. You may have noticed in the references I used in my work, there were very few references to hijab, niqab, jilbab, and even less mention of the so-called victimization these women suffer. In reality, these issues rarely come up in my research. The issues that concern the women I speak to are much deeper, more critical, and actually common to women of all backgrounds in Britain. These women want to speak of their work, their friendships, their views on youth and social media, and their concerns for our shared future. Do these issues look very Muslim? Do they look South Asian? Do they even look religious? I would like to venture that they are not. They are shared by women from all walks of life and all backgrounds in Britain. And this is where I believe the crux of the matter lies. We have a lot more in common than we care to recognize. However, what does set my respondents apart is that the vast majority work within a faith-based paradigm, and they do so of their own choice. They are secure and proactive in their identities as both Muslims and British citizens, and they are bearers of change and social development in their communities. And in fact, if we probe deeper, we find that secularization as a national project does very poorly in accommodating women's lived realities generally. There is a perceived lack of value given to their unpaid social contributions, their caring roles, their family lives, and in not addressing these very real yet hidden concerns of women today, liberal secular approaches have fallen short. For example, the simplistic dichotomy between modern and traditional women really is of limited value. It just does not work for women generally, be they Muslim or otherwise. Similarly, many a Muslim woman has been othered because she cho chooses to don the headscarf in a society that clearly sees the hijab as a symbol of male subjugation and as her rejecting liberal secular values. And often this without ever having talked to a Muslim woman. And while at no point would I deny that deeply ingrained patriarchal practices can and do undermine Muslim women, widely held grand narratives such as the veil and victimhood image of Muslim women can be and are unhelpful to individual women. 
We must begin to recognize and celebrate different ways of being feminine, of being the other, and actually of the other being invited to become one of us in Western society. To give a conceptual framework to the negotiated strategies employed by the women seeking alternatives to the liberal worldview, I appropriate the concept of hybridized spaces. Apologies for throwing in a bit of theory here. Um, in particular, the work of Homi Baba employs the term hybridized spaces to move away from the notion of fixed and authentic cultural identities. And for me, this really is problematic when we look at the debate about integration that we were speaking about this morning. When you talk about integration, it's as though there's something homogenous and fixed to integrate to. Yet, if you were to put 10 social scientists end to end, you wouldn't come to a conclusion as to what British values and British society actually meant. So, Baba argues that all forms of culture are continually in a process of hybridity. But for me, the importance of hybridity is not to be able to trace two original moments from which the third emerges. Rather, hybridity to me is the third space which enables other alternative positions to emerge. For my purposes, it is the idea of a constant flux and negotiation which resonates. The creation of selfhood, I won't disappoint you, religious or otherwise, can be seen as a journey and not an arrival. And in particular, this concept of a third space seems apt in describing the strategies employed by the women in my sample in trying to marry their presence in a Western liberal environment to their cultural and religious identification. My work argues against the homogenization and essentialization of the experiences of people who are sometimes trying to juggle dissonant and opposing loyalties. Looking to the future, Baba envisions the creation of this third space as an opening up of sites for negotiation and dialogue. And this, I believe, is exactly what the women in my sample are doing. In fact, the ongoing construction of robust and positive identities is indeed empowerment itself. An empowerment that enables previously subdued voices to rise over and above two oppositional principles to mobilize emergent and completely unanticipated forms of agency. To summarize, what does this third space look like for them? It is a space not defined by superficial concerns of dress and image. It is a space driven by turning experiences of so-called oppression and victimization on their heads to unleash their transformative potential. It is a space empowered by deeply held sacred beliefs in the midst of a secular society. It is a space that, once created, enables these women to confidently not just hold in themselves, but to give back to a society in which they have invested so much, a society which they want to better for the future of their children. And looking forward, harnessing the power of individual relationships and informal dialogue, I believe that those of us working at community levels can facilitate the creation of these spaces into community and interfaith spaces must be created where we all feel safe and welcome to discuss issues of commonality to us and to allow, allow finally the other to become us and to ask burning questions not of the Daily Mail, the Times and the East Enders caricatures created about us but of each other, of real people in real communities. I humbly suggest that this may be a very fruitful experience the urgency of which cannot be understated. And, looking to the future, they, as the women in my sample, continue to negotiate and develop these spaces, they are showing that it is possible to hold multiple identities, British, Muslim, feminine, civic, yet still offer contribution as members of a minority faith in the liberal, secular majority that is Britain today.